Wow, you got to start somewhere. That's a good place to start. Man, um, that's why it is so important for us to sing because God, um, there's no way to explain my daughter, Patrick's kids. Uh, there's no way to explain what it is to hear your children sing. But I'm sure as our Heavenly Father, there's nothing like hearing us sing uh, when it's from our hearts. The old man that discipled me, Claude Townsend, was the worst singer I have ever known. And he would come and sit in this room and screech to the top of his lungs. Couldn't hit any note we were playing. And yet he sang to the Lord. And I promise you, from the father's side, those are sweet sounds. Very painful for all of us, but very, very sweet for heaven. The title of today's message is, Are We There Yet? It is almost impossible to take a trip with children. Um, I mean, you're barely a few blocks from the house, and you start hearing it, Are We There Yet? And then throughout the whole trip, Are We There Yet? Um, children rarely have a sense of direction or distance or time. Uh, we used to tell our girls when they were little, they'd say, Are We There Yet? And we'd say, It's three more Barneys. And you say, well, what does that mean? They knew that a Barney, the program, was about 30 minutes, so they knew how long it took to watch that. So three Barneys would be an hour and a half, and that's how we measured time. So are we there yet? Four Barneys. It's all, it's all very scientific. So let me ask you the question, where is there? So as an adult, you say, well, are we there yet? I don't know. You tell me, where is there? How will you know when you get to your there? Is it a job? Now I know well, I'm, I made it. I'm there. Is it being married? Is it kids, grandkids? Is it a certain amount? If you have a portfolio of people that have money and manage their money and are trying to do well, uh, they have, they have what they call a number. And you say, well, what's your number? Some people, it's a million bucks in the bank. Some people, it's five million, a hundred million, whatever it is. And you say, well, is that your there? So when you get to your there, are you there yet? Or are you still not there yet? Um, if you really don't know where you're going and where there is, you may never get there. So the obvious answer for a trip, a destination is, you know, if you're driving from here to New York or somewhere and you say, well, are we there yet? You won't know you're there until you see New York and you go, yeah, we're here because that's our destination. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, if you're going nowhere, by the way, you never get there. Uh, so it is very important to know where you're going and where there is. And we say things like uh, that person or that per you're, you're going nowhere. We literally have people like they're going nowhere. They're just kind of roaming around, wandering around, driving around. There's no destination. There's no purpose. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, and if you think that's a misspelling, if you look in Scripture, Abram, before God made a covenant with him, his name was spelled A-B-R-A-M in our, in our translation. When he, the covenant was made with God, he became Abraham, and the, the H in his name represented the name of God, Yahweh, so you would have the Ab Abraham, and before it was just Abram. So this is before the covenant was made, and the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So Abraham's there is where? He didn't tell him. And if you go read this um, in Acts chapter 7, you don't have to go over there necessarily, but here uh, it says, verse 3, get out of your country, this conversation with Abram, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. And then in Hebrews eleven eight, 8, 
Let me just jump ahead here a little bit, and then we'll come back to Genesis. Hebrews 11:8. it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So are you okay if God tells you to go to a place and you don't know where that place is, so how will you know when we're there yet? You go with the information that he gives you and you wait till he says, you're there is here. And you say, well, I'm not going unless I know where I'm going. I'm not that kind of person. Then you can't, you can't live by faith. Because clearly he says here again, let's read it. Go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went, went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So if you go back up to the first few verses, get out of your country, 75 years, his country, from your family, with his family, and from your father's house. Everything that was familiar to him. So if God said to you, uh, you want to know if we're there yet, I'm not even going to tell you where the there is yet. But I'm telling you to go. Now, that takes some faith. That takes some trust in God. And this is God picking why God picked Abram. I don't know. Why did he pick me? Why did he pick you? You can't be a Christian unless he picks you. I can't explain it, but it's just how it works. So if you're a Christian, you got picked. And if you got picked, God has a purpose. And there is a there somewhere, but you have to trust him until you're there yet. Okay? Uh, I remember being in seminary, and there were guys uh, that were about to graduate, and they would say, you'd hear them say something like this, you know, I've told the Lord I'm willing to go anywhere he wants me to go in southwest Arkansas. <laughs> right? In other words, anywhere in that, those square miles. That's not anywhere. That's limiting, limiting God to a spot. And I highly recommend being very careful by saying anything that starts with God with, I will never. Because you might as well just do a change of address because that's where you're going. <laughs> right? You might throw in a Lord willing, that's not where he wants me to go. But Lord, I will go anywhere you want me to go, do whatever you want me to do, say whatever you want me to say, I yield because I am not going to lock up in a battle that he will win every time. You're going to lose that battle. So be willing um, wherever you're there is. Go to uh, Psalm 37. Now, what if there is not necessarily just a place as it was in Abram's life? What if there is a frame of mind, an attitude, a way of looking at life? Um, I'll read you a bunch of verses here that pertain to this. Psalm 37, 3 to 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That is a their life. So you say, are we there yet? I don't know. Are you there yet? Do we trust in the Lord and do good? Do we dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness? Do I delight myself also in the Lord and see that he shall give me the desires of your heart? Now, a lot of people use this verse and say, it says, well, if I delight myself in the Lord, he's going to give me what, I, what my heart wants. If you and when you delight yourself also in the Lord... He is your delight, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart change when he is your delight. Does everybody see this? The more time you spend with the Lord, it's, there's certain things I can't even want anymore. I can't even muster the oomph to say, ooh, I'd love to have that. I just like, I know I don't need that. There's no sense asking God for that. I don't want that. 
And the more you delight yourself in him, the desires of your heart change, but the more you start getting the desires of your heart, because if you delight in him, the things he gives you to desire are the things he wants you to have anyway. And so things start showing up. You're like, wow, that's exactly what I asked for. Like, yeah, exactly. Because that's what you need. That's who he is. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. But look at that, look at that life. Is, are these words in my life? Trust, um, feed, delight, commit, trust. Are, are those the characteristic words that define me as a person? Is that where I am? Is that my there? Look at 37.23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. So you say, well, what does that mean? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So where are you going? How, are, are we there yet? I don't know, where are you going? You, sh you should be going wherever he is directing you to go and he delights in wherever you go. Now, I, I understand sometimes people push back on this with me and say, well, dude, it sounds like you're like getting messages from God all the time. Okay, let me just go back to this verse. Jesus talked about the fact that his sheep know his voice. They hear his voice. If you are a Christian and you say that you cannot hear the voice of God, something has gone terribly wrong. There is so much noise, there is so much pushback, maybe there's so much sin that, that you don't want to hear what he says. If you will be quiet and you confess your sins and you trust and commit and do all these things, he is going to direct your path. Another passage, he's going to make your path straight, we'll read in a minute. Um, you say, but I don't get that. Here's where a lot of my not getting that and where it all broke down and has broken down and breaks down for me. When I don't want him and his will and his way, then all of a sudden I claim to not be able to hear him. And so I march off and go do what I want to do when I want to do it and see how that works out. And God allows me to do that. He's merciful. He's, there's discipline that comes with it. And I get to the end of that and he says, okay, so what are we doing here? Well, this is where I ended up. Like, well, how did you end up here? Well, I, I, I ditched on you. Okay, so are you ready to listen now? This is, let's pick up where we left off. Pay attention. This is what I'm telling you. Um, it's amazing. I guess this is not much of a thing anymore. But for a very long time on freeways, and there still are a few of these, you see these exits, and there's these big, giant, triple X signs. Has anybody ever seen these? Raise your hand if you've seen those. See all these people, oh, I never even noticed that. Didn't, didn't even know they were up there, right? So there's these porn places along freeways. You say, well, who stops there? Who's, going, who's pulling off the freeway and pulling into a porn shop on a trip, right? Who are these people? But the same question could be asked of us. Who are these Christians that they're driving down the highway going where God wants them to go and then they see a sign, some cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, some distraction, and next thing you know, they're exiting. That's not where they're going. And then the sign says 10 miles to the right and now they're 10 miles off their path and they get down there, it's a disaster. You say, well, who would stop at a porn shop? Who would do that? Who would do what we're doing? Where are we now? And you say, well, how did I get here? You don't just end up places. We make choices. And if he says, this is where we're going, listen, if there's an exit or a turn, I will tell you. You say, well, then if you live that kind of life, you'd be praying all the time. Exactly. <laughs> Without ceasing. Without ceasing. Because you're in a relationship. It's talk. Now, it's not always talk, 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 talk. And I've, I've shared this with people. If, if Michael and I sit right here in front of me, if Michael and I get in the car and he's going to ride with me to San Antonio and we don't know each other very well, there's a good chance it's going to be, how are you? How's your family? What's going on? If I really know him, I'm going to get in the car and go, dude, I'm exhausted. I'm going to take a nap. And I'm going to wake up in about four hours and go, oh, are we there yet? <laughs> because I'm not trying to prove to him or engage. We already know each other. So with God's the same way. You, you're not always asking for stuff, and sometimes you just ride. 
But if you're walking with God the way it's supposed to be working, when he says something, you go, yes, sir, thank you, sir. In other words, speak to that person. Turn here. Park there. Go in that store. You say, well, this would be nuts. I'd be so confused all the time. Look at how confused you are living the way you're living. Try his way. And then you end up places that you would never have been, the right kind of places, and then things start happening. You're like, what in the world? This is, this, only God could have done this. Exactly. Go to Psalm 118, 24. Now, this is a great there verse. Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Which day is he talking about? This day. Which this day? Every day is this day. So one way to be there, you're trying to get there, wherever there is. Here's, here's there. There is today. It's the day the Lord has made, so what is my choice? I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. So now you've got words like rejoice, be glad, previous verses, trust, feed, delight, commit, trust. I mean, boom, 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 all these verses, all these words. And if those are the words that characterize my life, then I'm going to get there a whole lot quicker. Because there is today. This is all I've got. The Bible talks about not being anxious for tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You can't even have tomorrow. You can't do anything about yesterday. Sufficient for today are the evils thereof. Let's take a deep, <coughs> a deep breath and cough and, and see what today's about. Psalm 119. And again, why am I reading you so much scripture? Because if you, if you get a little taste of this, you'll go, wait, that's in the Bible? Go read your Bible. You'd be amazed how he can instruct you. Psalm 119.1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Just to verse 3, look at this. Who is this person? They're a blessed person, I can tell you that. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. In other words, God, that's what I want. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I, lean, when I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's there. You live that. You want that. You want him. Then you're not going to be sitting around going, are we there yet? Like it's somewhere off in the future. And those, are, those things exist. But sometimes today is the day. And when you figure that out, then you're not like constantly, there's, oh, we got to go somewhere, do something, buy something. It's all about that. No, it's all about him. And if you wake up in the morning, you're alive, you're breathing, you know there's promise, there's purpose, and he's got something for you to be and something for you to do. Let's figure out what that is. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way. Nothing wrong with making plans. But the Lord directs his steps. So there's nothing wrong with having a plan. Okay, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to, you know, certain things in my life. But you have to allow the Lord to direct your steps. And he can say, don't go there. He knows where the trouble is. Um, he knows where the pitfalls are. Just, just trust him. You say, well, I don't want to go that way. If, if you know his voice and he said, take a right, take a right. Why argue with God? Proverbs 20, 24. Uh, very parenthetically, for those of you watching, you can't pick up on this, but I will tell you as a pastor, this is one of the best sounds in the world. You hear that noise? When people are finding Scripture in their own Bible, now, a lot of times I use my phone and look up stuff, but that is some kind of sweet noise, people reading Scripture. Unless you've got a Bible that's cut out with your phone in it and you're on Facebook and it just sounds like you're doing that. 
Proverbs 20, verse 24. A man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? Um, I just got to tell you, without him, I am lost. I will be wondering. Um, you just don't know where to go. You have all kind of options. You say, well, I'm going to go do this. How do you know that's what he wants you to do? When it comes to any decision, but especially huge decisions, I do not recommend if, you get, if you're going to get married, take a new job, anything massive, big decisions, do not make any big decisions without prayer and fasting. You have access to God himself, and you, you, what you're basically saying when you fast is, God, I want you, I want what you want more than I want food. That's how bad I want you. And I'm giving up food to focus on you, and I am listening because I cannot get this wrong. I cannot marry the wrong person. I cannot take the wrong job. I cannot move to another city just randomly. I need you to speak to me. And if you want to know more about fasting, go to like Isaiah 58 or uh, Matthew 6, and the New Testament is replete with fasting. I don't think it's a, if it's an if thing, it's a when. Jesus assumed that we would fast. Ecclesiastes 3. We're, we're going to be interrupt this program for an announcement over here. <laughs> Maybe you should be flipping through your Bible, not your phone. That's what I'm saying. Just giving her a hard time. It's not like we can't ignore someone's phone going off. You can silence your phone at that little thing on the side. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 3. Look how verse 1 starts. To everything there is a season. So you say, are we there yet? I don't know. See if you can find yourself in this passage. A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Um, and this is part of life. Uh, a couple walked in today, newborn little baby, just the Christ said, dude, this will mess you up forever. Um, so on the one hand, there they sit looking at this beautiful little girl. It's time to be born. But sooner or later, somebody's going to die. I did a funeral just the other day, and this makes people a little uncomfortable, I'm sure, at these funerals. But it's a memorial service for a gentleman who's dead. And I said, someone in this room is next. Who is it? Well, we, you know, look at the old people. Nobody says you've got to be old to die. And the fact of the matter is in that room, could have been me, could have been anybody, someone is next. So there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn. Now look at this. What did he just say? A time to weep, a time to laugh. And then he jumps it to a time to mourn and a time to dance. So weeping and laughing are one thing. Mourning and dancing are something else. Different kind of opposites. Massive swing. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. That's my life verse right there. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it was Billy Graham's wife who said you, fin you spend the first half of your life accumulating things and the second half of your life trying to give things away, throw things away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So, to everything there is a season. What season are you in? Where are you? Where is your there right now? Which one of these things? Could you say, well, yeah, it's, it's a time of mourning. Okay. But let me tell you something about seasons. They don't stay. 
What did it say? To everything there is a season. Now you say, well, I'm in a season of mourning. If you're a healthy person and things go well, your season will change and it will shift to dancing. Weeping to laughter. Because if you get stuck in one of these theirs, you're in trouble. Um, I got a friend, I think he's in the room. I think I see him over here. We meet once a week, and uh, he came to see me one day, and he was a mess. His dog had died. He said, well, it's a dog. Let me tell you something. If your dog dies, I understand if your grandma dies, that's a lot bigger deal. Your wife, your, I get all that. But there's something about a dog dying, right? How many of you had a dog die? Yeah, well, I woke up a few weeks ago with a dead dog laying on my side of the bed. He was pretty sick, and there he was. He was gone. So... Am I messed up about that? Not today. Um, will I get over that? Sure. What's a dog? Oh, you shouldn't be so casual. It's a dog. There's another couple in the room lost a dog. Same time we lost our dog. Okay, so it's okay to be sad about a dog or any other thing going on in your life. You can't stay there. Well, what happened? My dog died. Dude, that was four years ago. That season should have passed. You've got to get on with it. You're never going to get there if you don't get past the seasonal theirs. So where are you in this process? So you say, well, Lord, my there is, um, it, it's, it's, not a, it's a time to refrain from embracing. It's got to go back to embracing. I mean, Rebecca and I have had plenty of challenges in our marriage. And there are times where it's literally kind of, maybe for more for her side or mine, like, don't touch me. Right? The last thing you're going to do is embrace because there's a time it's not about embracing. It's about distance and sorting something out. But when that season passes, there's a time for embracing. And you have to get to that or you won't survive as a couple. You cut somebody off, you shut somebody down, you can destroy a relationship. You say, well, that's the season we're in. Seasons come and go. They don't come and stay. That's the nature of a season. Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Um, you say, well, I know where I'm going. Really? Where are you going? And how are you going to know when you get there, wherever you're going? You say, well, I've got my life all planned out, really. And what if you die between now and then? Then what? People who trust in God have committed their lives to Christ, who are following him, hold things very loosely, and there's really never too much arrogance. The people that got, I got it all figured out. I got a plan. I got, I've got it all mapped out. This is what I'm about. This is where I'm going. You know what? You don't know that. It's a lot of Lord willing, this is what we're doing, humility. Okay, Lord, this is what I believe that I hear you saying. Please confirm that, and we'll go in that direction. But if you change that, I'm fine with that. Be very careful about setting goals and worshiping goals. It's about worshiping God, not goals. Because if you get your goals wrong and you can't release from your goals, you chase those no matter what. Philippians 3, New Testament. Philippians 3, verse 7. Now, this is a guy who lived there. You say, well, was he there yet? No. Ultimately, he was not the, at the ultimate there. But every day, it appears that Paul, when he writes this stuff, Philippians 7, uh, 3, 7 but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or dung, some translations, that I may gain Christ. If that is who you are and where you are, you are there now. And you say, but is that the goal? I tell this to most people I disciple. 
God is more interested in you than what you can do for him. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think, I've got to do something to get God to love me or to keep loving me. I've got to perform or I'm going to get cut. I'm going to get taken off the roster. I'm going to get benched. I've got to keep performing. There is, there is nothing to do with performance. That's a nice thing. But if you don't know that God loves you and cares about you as a person, then you will never ultimately even do what he wants you to do if you don't know who you are and who you are in relation to him. So when you settle that, you take a deep breath and you go, wow, there's nothing like having Jesus. This is who I am. I can take a deep breath. There's peace. There's joy. The fruit of the Spirit starts to manifest. And like, it's going to be okay. No matter what tomorrow brings, today's good. It's going to be okay. Because I want him and he already has determined he wants me. And God will never love me any more or any less than he does right now. And that is always true. And I never knew that. I didn't know that he just loved me. Another one, Philippians 4, 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So wherever you are, there you, there you are, be there. And he said, well, wherever that is, I've, I've learned to be content. I know how to be abased. In other words, to not have but just enough. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And this is the context of verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So you say, well, our, we're at a time, a season, where there's not abundance. We barely have enough. Then be there. You say, well, it's really hard. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can do it. Uh, maybe I haven't I've never told this story. I don't know. When I was in seminary, I was poor. Um, I lived in a little room, had a bathroom, it was kind of a shack thing is what I could afford to rent near the campus. I had a car that I think someone gave me and it had no brakes. <laughs> so when I had to go somewhere, I mean, it was metal on metal. If, if I hit my brakes, you didn't need a horn. You just tap your brakes, and it would grind and make that sound. <clears throat> grinding noise. So when I went through stoplights, I'd always go slow. I'd go through stoplights, and I was constantly looking for where I was going to ditch. Because if I hit my brakes, nothing was going to happen. And, every, and I ate minute rice and grated cheese. Man, I love me some minute rice and grated cheese to this day. Um, you'd think I wouldn't like that, but I still do. And there was a Dairy Queen close enough for me to drive down there, and I would collect all the coins that I had. And if it was like 37 cents, whatever I had, I'd drive down to Dairy Queen, I'd drive through the, through the drive through and I'd say to the lady, I'd hand her all my coins. I'd say, I want the biggest double dip coin I can get for that. Whatever that is. That's all I got, so give me that. You say, well, that's crazy. Who lives that way? I don't know. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. Those people. And that kid. <laughs> now you say, well, that sounds terrible. That's where my there was at that point. You say, well, if somebody's asked you then, are you there yet? I would have maybe now looking back, I'd have said, I guess so. Because I've got to learn how to be abased. I've got to learn how to be content with that and know that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you either can or you can't, and either he can or he can't. And if he can't, it's all going to fall apart. But the point is, he can. Now you say, well, do you prefer having more than enough? I don't know. Because there's plenty of verses about that where the, the, the danger is that you have more than you need and then you just say, well, I don't need God. I'm set. Go help somebody else, God. We're good over here. And now all of a sudden, you think you've arrived because you did something. It takes as much of Christ strengthening you to be to abound as it does to be abased. You think it doesn't. 
but wait till it flips, and now you got more than enough, and then you got to trust him. Very hard for people to pray, give us this day our daily bread, when that's a no-brainer. People who are trying to find literal daily bread, when they find it, their prayer was answered. We throw bread away because it gets a little mold on it or something. You should never throw it away, just toast it, and then you can't see it. Uh, that's an old poor trick. <clears throat> um, <laughs> that's terrible. Go listen to this song sometime. It's not a Christian song. It's by Lone Star. I'm already there. If you've ever heard this song, it's powerful. Uh, and there's some things when I hear that song, parallels, where I'm wondering where God is. And he's like, I'm already there. I'm already in your situation. You may not see me. You may not recognize me. But I'm already there. Let me read you a story. After 40 years of faithful service to the Lord as a missionary to Africa, Henry Morrison and his wife were returning to New York. As the ship neared the dock, Henry said to his wife, Look at the crowd. They haven't forgotten about us. However unknown to Henry, the ship also carried President Teddy Roosevelt returning from a big hunting trip in Africa. Roosevelt stepped from the boat with great fanfares. People were cheering, flags were waving, bands were playing, and reporters waiting for his comment. Henry and his wife slowly walked away unnoticed. They hailed a cab, which took them to the one-bedroom apartment, which had been provided by the mission board. Over the next few weeks, Henry tried but failed to put the incident behind him. He was sinking deeper into depression when one evening he said to his wife, This is all wrong. This man comes back from a hunting trip and everyone throws a big party. We give our lives in faithful service to God for all these many years, but no one seems to care. His wife cautioned him that he should not feel this way. Henry replied, I know, but I just can't help it. It just isn't right. His wife then said, Henry, you know God doesn't mind if we honestly question him. You need to tell this to the Lord and get this settled now. You'll be useless in his ministry until you do. Henry Morrison then went to his bedroom, got down on his knees, and shades of Habakkuk began pouring out of his heart to the Lord. Lord, you know our situation and what's troubling me. We gladly served you faithfully for years without complaining, but now, God, I just can't get this incident out of my mind. After about 10 minutes of fervent prayer, Henry returned to the living room with a peaceful look on his face. His wife said, it looks like you resolved the matter. What happened? Henry replied, the Lord settled it for me. I told him how bitter I was about the president receiving this tremendous homecoming, but no one even met us as we returned home. When I finished... It seemed as though the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, but Henry, you're not home yet. Now, ultimately, the question is, are we there yet? And the answer is no. You can be at your current there, whatever situation, whatever season. But when you get there, you'll know you're there. You'll be home. And if you wonder, you say, well, how will I know that I'm there? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. And it won't be the pearly gates. It won't be the streets of gold. It won't be the tearless faces. It will be Jesus. And when you see him, you'll know you're there. Now you say, well, I just feel like I'm just here. Let me encourage you to do something. Put a cross in front of your here, and you'll have your there. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you do in our lives. I pray, first of all, for people who know that if, if they were to die today, it would not go well because they don't have a there yet. And they need to settle some things with you. And I pray that they would understand how much you love us, you love them, 
and that you already know, you know where they've been, what they've done, even what they're going to do, what they're doing. And what you're waiting for is them to humble themselves and just say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I can't fix any of this. My way does not work. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin and to purchase eternal life for me in heaven with you. I accept as a gift. I ask you to come live in me, through me, change me. Like being born a second time. A new start. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being patient with me. And I pray that you would show me how to be there every day now that I have it there in eternity. And Father, for people who are believers and can and could hear you and trust you and commit to you and delight in you, but sin has gotten in the way, or they're in a really tough season, and it's not the dancing, laughing, living side it's the, the tough side to the seasons. And they've lost heart maybe and wish they were there, maybe even on the other side, but they're not. I thank you, Lord, that whether we are abased or abound, that you can give us contentment wherever we are and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, who gives us strength. So I pray strength for people, Lord, who feel like they're in a, in a dark season and, and remind them that the seasons change and remind them that you can be trusted and that you are faithful even when we're not and lift up the hands that hang down, feeble knees, and give them the ability to walk and run the way you intended. We love you, Lord. Um, we thank you for loving us. Um, no one ever cared for us like Jesus. And we pray that our lives would reflect our trust in you and your trust in us as we live this day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, first of all, for anybody in the room or beyond, and you prayed a very simple prayer, and you know that God went from being everywhere to moving inside your heart, your life, um, the biggest decision you ever make in your whole life, uh, send us an email, please, just to reunion at reunionchurch.org and say, I prayed, I made the decision to trust Christ, well, however you want to put it, whatever words you want to put it in. Um, we are here not just to tell you about Jesus, introduce you to Jesus, but to help you get to know him. And we have people that would be more than happy to disciple you, walk alongside you, and help you get up and running where you can do that for someone else down the road. So please let us hear from you. If you've got prayer requests, uh, whatever we can do to help, please send us an email, reunion at reunionchurch.org. All right. Um, we're going to do our offering. Uh, we, here in the building, we've got a couple of receptacles, red boxes at the door when you go out. Uh, but anybody can do what uh, most have been doing online, reunionchurch.org. There's a give tab there, and uh, we appreciate your faithfulness primarily to him and how God provides for this church through that. Uh, we are very grateful. Okay. Um, I think we're there. We are going to stand and sing our way out of here. And uh, where are the kids? We can't sing without the kids. They're not. All right. We'll get them back up here. We'll get them back up here. Great job. All right. Let's stand. We'll sing our way out of here. Love you guys. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day and week. And we'll see you soon.